That's right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, I'm Ann Eller right here with you on Meet Me at the Diner. Beautiful day out there, and I have Matt Moore, chairman of the South Carolina GOP. It's hard to believe that uh, we just went through an election cycle, and now we're getting geared up for another one. In fact, he is up for re-election as the South Carolina GOP chairman. How you doing today, Matt? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Uh, you know, you certainly have broken a lot of records being the youngest chairman and really bringing the South Carolina GOP uh, a lot more uh, noise, shall we say, uh, in this last year or so. Well, last year, you're right, was our most successful year in the history of the state party. It's hard to believe we've been in existence almost 150 years, but yet had our most successful year Last year, we are headed into a very important election cycle that's coming up here with the presidential election, not only because of the primary, but also because Tim Scott, our, our great U.S. senator, is back on the, on the ballot. And so we're focused on a few things, the first of which is recruiting good candidates. Tim Scott's one of those for U.S. Senate. For US Senate. We're focused on uh, using technology to the best of our ability. We've done a great job with that over the past couple of years. But really, I'm most proud of the grassroots work we've done especially in this past election cycle, to be able to let good people like Governor Haley and others. We, we built a preeminent state party organization in terms of our grassroots, so we'll, we'll keep doing those things over the next couple of years. I'm excited to be at the helm. Yeah, uh, you know, you certainly have had a uh, quite a history with working with the GOP, and to now be at its helm has uh, certainly <laughs> been a good position for you, I think. It's been a lot of fun. Of course, it's an honor. Uh, we, uh, the state committee and our grassroots make my work possible. They, they are the front lines of, of electing good conservative people across the state. We rely on them. So I'm proud to serve them most of all. Sure. Now, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, though, you know, for the uh, future of the Republican Party, do you think there's a lot of conversation, a lot of noise, they now say out there, between being more conservative or middle of the road, where do you think the, con the uh, Republican Party is headed? Well, we've always been a conservative party. I think since our founding, we, ha we have shown those conservative principles through all the things that we've supported. You know, a lot of people want to blame Republicans for the, the country's problems or the state's problems. I think it's, in fact, just the opposite. I think it's the Democrats, the liberals, and the progressives who uh, who have destroyed some of the foundations that make this country great. Those are faith, family, economic freedom. So all the policies that, that we're working towards here in the state, and I hope nationally too, are focused on, on those things. And I want the most conservative possible po person to win the presidency. And, of course, here in South Carolina, we'll put those people through uh, a good test. We'll ask them the tough questions in our backyards, at our churches. Uh, it's a pretty unique thing to, to live in a country where we get to we get to actually meet and talk to the presidents for candidate uh, for, for candidates for president. In most countries, it doesn't happen. So it's, it's a pretty unique opportunity for us in the next 13 months or so. Sure, but are, are you are you leaning? Do we you believe that we need ultra conservative or that's why I said more middle of the road conservative? Where do you think that the Republican Party is going to be going? Well, I, I want I want a party. That, that's bold in its conservatism, that not only talks the talk, but walks the walk, that, that puts forth good policies in Congress, that puts forth good policies at the state level. That's why I've been proud to stand up for companies like Uber and their personal car service, where you can go on your iPhone and get the car to come pick you up. I talk about free markets, the power of free markets, and the power of economic freedom to lift people uh, into better circumstances that people just want to hand up, not a hand, hand out. So one thing I, I've encouraged our elected officials to do is to reach out to people who don't look like them, to reach out to young people, to have a real positive message for what conservatism means for this country. And we know that conservatism works, and it's our job as party leaders and elected officials to sell our policies, to sell our ideas. And that's what I'm hopeful for in this presidential election that's coming up. Sure. You know, one of the things that I heard, I was watching a, a special that they were doing on Cuba, and, of course, the question about should Cuba be... Um, uh, should we restore relations? And what they were talking about is, in this art, in this uh, show is the fact that the older generation believes that they should not be included because they know the horrific things that happen. But the young people, and this was actually people out of Miami, the young people 
did not uh, have any recollection of anything bad, so they were more open to, uh, to having relationships with Cuba. And, you know, I thought that was interesting when we look at inclusiveness and progressivism and all these issues that are out there. How do we convince our young people that being more conservative is the way to go? Well, I think in the case of Cuba that we have to convince people and make people see that, that opening and normalizing relations with Cuba is about just more than just them having nice beaches and great restaurants. Sure. That, in fact, you know, in every situation where we have been promised by countries when we open up trade routes or, or diplomatic relations, when they promise that they will improve their human rights conditions, they're generally lying. Nothing's improved in China. Uh, nothing's improved in a lot of the dictatorships in communist countries, I think Vietnam is one of them, where we have been promised that things will get better. Now, certainly more people in those countries are living in the middle class, but it's, it's at the point of a bayonet uh, with free speech and with the ability to move around and move freely uh, in the economy and, and to lead the country. Sure. And so we got to be, really be real careful kind of things that we jump into, particularly as it relates to Cuba. And I know that, um, that some have sp spoken in different directions in the Republican Party, that's okay. But we've got to be cautious in dealing with, dealing with dictators. And I, I think the U.S. Senate's going to have something to say about the, the diplomatic budget that's spent there uh, and, and, of course, the Obama administration's relations with Cuba. So we'll see. You know, but you're right. In, in the bigger picture, we've, we've got to help young conservatives, young activists, and even uh, libertarian Republicans uh, understand that our, our principles are the principles of freedom and that we shouldn't be a party that, uh, that, that, that's for uh, cronyism and back scratching. We have to be strong on ethics, and so those those are the things that I've encouraged the elected officials to be to be aware of. Yeah, I I think that's that's the point I actually was making is that how do we when uh, progressive is, I guess we should say more than democratic even the progressive side is so open to everything. How do we convince our younger people to be part of the Republican Party? Well, I think most young people are looking for economic freedom. They want to move out of their parents' basement. They, they want good jobs. They want they want to work. Uh, I think that to think anybody wants to sit at home, most people don't want to sit at home. They, they want a job. Jobs give people dignity. And we, we can show young people that despite all the promises of the Obama administration and all the promises that Hillary Clinton is going to make as, as a candidate, that over the past 50 years, that the policies of the progressives and the liberals haven't worked, that in fact... They've done just the opposite. More people are on assistance. More people are struggling than ever before. And so we can make a, if we can do a good job of not only explaining that to people, but about being positive, being vision focused, and being policy focused in terms of how Republican and conservative policies help the country, we'll be successful. I don't think we'll be successful if we, we talk negatively continually about the Obama administration or what's already happened. We've got to be talking about what's going to happen if people elect conservatives and Republicans. Yeah, and I think we definitely, uh, the Republican Party needs to get on this uh, technology bandwagon because it sure did the Democrats uh, well four years ago. That's right, that's right. And one thing that's interesting, I mentioned my uh, efforts to help Uber, the technology company, earlier. That's not just because I like Uber and I use Uber, the car service. It's because I think that South Carolina ought to be a state that welcomes innovators, state, a state that welcomes entrepreneurs. And if you're afraid based on the state you live in, to start a country, that, that's a little bit scary. And so those people have access to states like North Carolina, to Georgia. Yeah, I want to be a state that, that, that attracts innovators, that attracts entrepreneurs. But you're right. We have closed the technology gap in terms of politics with the Democrats, but there's always, there's always more work to be done. It's an arms race, and they're, they're working just as hard as we are to improve their technology, too. Sure. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that there in the presidential election, there was a lot of activity with the South Carolina Tea Party, particularly in Iowa. We had a lot of that. How, how do we see the Republican strategy shaping up with the Tea Party? Look, I, I welcome Tea Party activists into the party. I think most Tea Party activists are, are good patriotic Americans. If you look at the original definition of a Tea Party, it was taxed enough already. You know, people who recognize that uh, the government gets enough of a share of what we make and what we produce already, and that we ought to be seeking policies that, that lead to a more pro prosperous and a more economically free America. So I'm, I'm hoping that Republican Tea Party members, uh, those liberty-leaning people in the Republican Party, will work together 
over the next 13 months to have a real robust debate about uh, what it means to be Republican in South Carolina, who can, who can appeal best to the electorate, and hopefully get the most conservative electable person uh, in the White House in 2016 and beyond. Yeah, I, you know, I, th- I think that's a, it seems like Tea Party has become a, uh, a bad word. I mean, this thing with Howard Dean, his comments on the American sniper about uh, those are uh, angry Tea Party people that are so much in favor of it. Where did that come from? Well, I, th- I think people, whether they're in the Tea Party, the Republican Party, whatever words you want to use to describe them, most Americans just want the future of the country to be brighter than it, than it is. That we recognize that, as I mentioned, that the Democrats' policies of, of less economic freedom, less states, less family, those policies, in fact, have hurt the country. So I think I think what you see a lot out of Hollywood, particularly in the in the mainstream media out of New York and Washington, is most of these people have a completely different educational history, a, a worldview than the traditional Republican. That's okay. It takes two wings to fly, but the condescension of these people makes makes you sick. And that Hollywood, Hollywood, if they want to make they make even more money, would do a better job of reaching out to conservatives and and the kind of people who go to see movies like American Sniper. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty excited to see that. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm uh, I'm excited to go. Right, I, I understand. Now, um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, Matt, and then we're going to talk a little bit about politics futuristically with the presidential race, but what do you see over the last year as some of your biggest accomplishments? And two, since you're up for re-election, what would you like to accomplish in the future as the uh, chairman of the South Carolina GOP? What we've accomplished over the past couple of years is building the preeminent state party in the country both in terms of election results and in all of our operations. We built a huge grassroots staff last year. We had 14 field offices, made over 3 million voter contacts. But more than that, I am, I am really pleased with where we are in technology. We, we used Facebook and social media last cycle as an incredible platform. We were able to do around 3 million just online hits on Facebook, uh, impressions for uh, Republican candidates and our issues. But going forward, I'm focused on those three things that I mentioned earlier. It's one being a a growing Republican Party that's diverse in viewpoints and in its faces, that that's conservative in its principles, and can, can elect the next generation of Republicans. Two, we're focused on on um, being a party that that's, that's advanced in technology, that uses 21st century tools to ensure those 21st uh, century victories, and. So those are really the things that we're focused on. We've got a great uh, positive vision for the state party. Over the next year and a half, our big focus is the primary. Okay. And then we'll move on to the U.S. Senate race for Tim Scott. See, look, see they're going to throw everything they have at Senator Scott. They know that he's a, he's a rising star in the Republican Party and that he represents all that's good about conservatism and about the Republican Party. And I suspect the Democrats will put up a very tough candidate against him. And let's never forget that in presidential elections, turnout's really high. It will be, it'll be about 75% turnout compared to, to 45 or 50% turnout. So we've got to get our message in front of as many people as possible in the next two years, and the presidential election is a good opportunity to do that. And so we'll keep being positive, we'll keep being vision-oriented, and we'll keep trying to build what I think is the best state party in the country. Well, I, I think that's great, um, Matt. Now, how do you think this uh, – uh, were you in Iowa last week? I, I went to Iowa last summer. I haven't oh, okay. been to Iowa in a while, but uh, I've, I've seen all the speeches. So. so what are you? So what are you thinking? What's the what's the early money? What are you thinking here, Matt? <laughs> We've got quite a big field here. Uh, you're gonna get me in trouble, Ann. <laughs> uh, I I'm ask kidding. the questions. <laughs> Look, I, I think people sitting at home listening, or people in their cars listening, ought, ought to be interested in candidates' records of achievement and. What has the candidate done in their time in the U.S. Senate? What have they done in their time in the governor's office? What have they done in their time as a private citizen that, that merits them being in discussion to be president of the United, of United States? The, the presidency is the highest and most important office in the world. So we've we got to take a real tough look at these, these folks and, and be real critical, I mean, quite frankly, uh, to see, you know, who's, who's cut out for this, who has not only the right experience, but who has the right mindset. And I think what's most important is having the right vision. You can have all these successes in the world and have the right mindset, but if you lack 
any sort of vision for the office and what it means to be the president and what it means to be an American, uh, I worry for the future of the country. Uh, so it's very important not only to ask what they've done, but what are they going to do. And uh, I think we'll have a good debate if that happens. Well, again, you are uh, what, first in the South? South Carolina We are. We are is. first in the South. We'll be the first primary after uh, after Iowa and New Hampshire and the southern states. And uh, I suspect our, our grassroots activists will, will, will be right there uh, on the front lines asking those tough questions. Um, how, how large, okay, if you're not going to tell me who you think, how large a field are we going to end up with here? I mean, we got everybody from Trump talking about jumping in. we got Ben Carson uh, in the wings here. And then we've got our usual suspects, everybody from uh, Romney to Bush. So uh, it looks like it could be a pretty huge field. It does. You know, last time I think we had either nine or ten candidates file. Right. And uh, I would think that this time around that the field will be a similar size. Uh, it's not going to be a coronation like it is for the Democrats or Hillary Clinton. They have, they have no primary. They're not debating the future of their party and the future of the country. Uh, I think that hurts them in the long haul. That Hillary Clinton is staying at home and not getting to sharpen her, her, her political skills. But, but whoever wins, I think, our primary process, and it should be over hopefully by, by early April or mid-April, I think whoever, our, whoever wins our process will be a very, very, very strong candidate because they'll, they'll have spent the past six or eight months uh, working uh, hand-in-hand with grassroots activists, working on their political skills, their speaking skills, and they'll have a really sharp message come August when we get to the general election. Well... You know, the only thing that that worries me is that we could be wore out with all this. I mean, here it is January, and the field is already jumping. We just went through an election. <laughs> well, I, th- I think there are 25 names out there. Uh, I don't think all 25 of those people will eventually file uh, for president. But, uh, you know, we have a, we have a robust de- debate in the party. Uh, I think we're not the Democrats. The, de- the Democrats have no debate. So uh, we're the party of debate, we're the party of ideas, we're the party of, of, of trying to figure out what works best for the country. And that, that's me. Really, that's okay. You know, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. And I think it, I think it excites our grassroots activists to, to be involved in the process. In, in South Carolina, if you don't meet a presidential candidate, it's your own fault. Uh, they're all over the place. So go out and meet them. Absolutely. If it's, uh, it is going to be uh, being part of a presidential election is pretty exciting. I mean, I look forward to all the conversations and people you get to talk to and, and all the quirks and seeing all those that almost make it and then those that don't. But it all comes down to a lot of it, doesn't it, though, Matt, is the money. Well, you know, money is important, but we also shouldn't let Wall Street or Silicon Valley decide who our nominee is. Look, the money is important in terms of building organizations and hiring the right people because, you know, the presidency is also about who you surround yourself with what staff you hire, what their visions are, their skills. You can't do it all yourself. Uh, so, so I'm not just a believer in, in, in somebody. I'm not just somebody who, who thinks that the fundraising matters. Sure, it's important. And sure, you got to do it. and you got to be competitive in terms of, of, of what you're raising because you got to raise a lot of money for the general election. Yeah. But I, don't, I don't think it's the only thing that matters. I think, I think political skill matters. Vision matters. The people you're hiring matters. And the, the money is not the end-all, be-all of politics. Well, they sure are going after the money already, though. <laughs> oh, they are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, money buys money. Money buys TV ads and T-shirts, right? And pam- and pamphlets and stuff. Right. And th- those are okay. Th- th- those are okay. Well, you know, I I tell you what, I uh, I, I really uh, think you're the right person for the job, and I certainly hope that uh, you're going to be able to continue doing such a good job for the Republican Party. Well, with God's grace, I will be. Thank you, Ann, for the time today. I really appreciate it. Well, and we'll look forward to maybe at some time you can uh, come sit down in the studio here and we can spend an hour talking about all philosophies of the Republican Party. Uh, I'd love to. I would love to. All right. Sounds good, Matt. Matt Moore, uh, GOP uh, chairman, and he wants to be it again. Thanks so much for calling in, Matt. Thanks, thanks Ann. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye.